Caesar's Column by Ignatius Donnelly A Story of the Future Introduction by Arthur Desmond Introduction Caesar's Column, a new and sensational book Ah, mammon slaves, your knees shall knock, your hearts in terror beat When God demands a reason for the sorrows of the street From America comes the most remarkable book upon social affairs that the century has produced. Edward Bellamy and Henry George are but doting drivelers compared with the author of this volume. Progress and poverty and looking backward suggest that the world is gradually growing towards a higher ideal and that if certain patent social adjustments are adopted, a kingdom of heaven on earth will be the result. Caesar's column has a far different story to tell and the future that it depicts for our civilization is a terrible and blood-curdling picture. The author, though crude in some things, has a prophetic instinct which impels him on to describe the, the overthrow of civilization in one tremendous revolutionary cataclysm brought about the greed of combined capitalists bent only on gain. The tale opens in the year 1988 and the author describes how the nations of the world passed under the control of a secret council of millionaires who had their hired agents in every corner of the earth and who on one and more occasion crushed out proletarian revolt with hired soldiers, hired press and hired representative governments. This secret council of plutocrats consisted of the brainiest capitalists in the world and their dicta decided the fate of every nation on earth. The author shows how, by judicious use of their gold, they purchased power and how they used that power to extort more gold from the labors of countless millions of human hirelings who worked on unceasingly. The book is written in the form of letters sent by one Gabriel Weltstein to a friend residing at a new European settlement of Uganda in Central Africa. Gabriel arrives in New York, a city of 10 million inhabitants by a vessel of the Intercontinental Direct Airline, and never having seen a great city before, his astonishment at the sights is abounded. The Aurora Borealis is used to illuminate it at night, electricity works like magic machinery, the luxury of the capitalistic class is something wonderful while the misery, brutality and vice of the lower classes is truly horrible. The money of the wealthy can purchase them everything that they can desire, including the daughters of the poor, and the seeding millions are ready to sell themselves, body and soul, for coppers to buy bread. The instincts of tigers and wolves had entered into both classes, and although their brains were fit for any villainy, their hearts were dead. They were a race without goodness or honor. The object of the rich was sensualism and material possessions, and the sole object of the poor was bread, bread, bread. Suicide had been reduced to a fine art. Man is a drug and a superfluity. The splendid carriages of the rich rolled into Eden-like parks, while policemen stood at the gates to keep out the ragged and wretched multitude. Courts, judges, jurists, newspapers were but the instruments of oppression and no man's life were safe who offended that tremendous oligarchy. Civilization became a gorgeous shell, beautiful outside but a mockery and sham, outwardly beautiful but inwardly full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. The joyless, sullen crowd brooded in enforced silence over their hellish wrongs. They had tried peaceful means to obtain an honest system of wealth distribution, but the gold of the plutocrats proved, in the end, more powerful than the grandest theories of Henry George and the earnest Christians. The ballot box became but a means of registering the orders of the oligarchy, and the arms but an instrument for enforcing those orders and holding the people in bondage. The people became hopeless of reform, and many of them regularly practiced scientific infanticide, saying, why should we breed more slaves to toil and starve and die? 
the earth was a hell of cruelty, murder and extortion, and the religion of the great reformer had become like an echo in the wilderness, while stunted starlings hunted for rats and mice in the sewers to satisfy the cravings of hunger. The Brotherhood of Destruction The oligarchy did not accomplish their sordid ends without making many fierce and bitter enemies. Men who were as cunning as their conquerors and prepared to go to any length for revenge. Such a man was Caesar Lamellini, chief of the secret society of destroyers. This society numbered over 100 millions of drilled men, sworn to fight to the death and destroy once and forever the civilization that was to them but a symbol of everything odious. The leaders of this secret proletariat band were men of determined purpose and cool calculation, who were prepared for every contingency, and who ultimately outwitted the plutocracy and overturned society in a holocaust of frightful slaughter. The Demons of the Air The oligarchy, in addition to enslaving the townspeople, had also plundered the farmers by means of mortgages. Until the peasantry was worse off than any other class, the produce of the land was the property of the rich, and even the land itself belonged to the banks. Therefore, when the day of judgment came, and the fight commenced, the peasantry poured into the city like wild beasts, intent only to raven and devour. Before the outbreak, the spies of the plutocracy had apprised them of danger, and preparations were made to slaughter the revolutionists wholesale, as had been so often done before. The plutocrats had in their command a vast army of drilled men, in addition the navy of the air. The latter consisted of airships that could sail at will over any spot and drop explosive shells which killed or suffocated anyone in the neighborhood. The men who commanded these airships, or demons as they were called, demanded more wages and the plutocracy at once granted their demand. This being known to the heads of the Brotherhood of Destruction, they offered these Praetorian guards of the air half the gold in the city if the ships would fight on the pride of the people. This offer was accepted and when the great day arrived the demons dropped their bonds of death among the ranks of the plutocrats destroying every living soul. The citizens raised barricades, the soldiery surrounded the city, but the peasantry surrounded the soldiery. Then came the demons overhead. The day of devolution, as described, is truly a blood-curdling scene. Hardly a capitalist was left alive, the whole city on fire, and the stench from the dead millions rising up. Mobs of infuriated men going to murder and plundering, while Caesar, the leader, becomes so excited as not to know what he is doing, and another leader of the Brotherhood, a Jew, decamps with 100 million of loot. The revolutionist, though triumphant, would not listen to anyone who proposed reconstruction, and the bloodshed continued from day to day until the civilization was completely destroyed. Thus, a hell of inquisitious injustice was turned into a holocaust of fearful slaughter. Retribution overtook the oligarchy for their heartless robbery and tyranny. A Ghastly Monument The bodies of the dead plutocrats were then gathered together and built into a column. The bodies were placed in layers and liquid cement poured around them, then another layer and another. A cavity was left in the center and filled with dynamite so that if ever an attempt was made to pull down the monument it would blow up and destroy everything and everybody for miles around. All the lawyers, politicians, capitalists, merchants, landlords, etc. that survived the first outbreak were set to work gathering the dead and building up the column with the idea that losing a little sweat would do them good. Then, upon the fearful monument, the following inscription was placed. This great monument was erected by Caesar Lamellini, commanding general of the Brotherhood of Destruction in commemoration of the death and burial of modern civilization. It is composed of the bodies of 25,000 human beings, who were once the bailers or the instruments of the rulers of this mighty but, Allah, ruined city. 
They were dominated by leaders who were altogether evil. They corrupted the courts, the juries, the newspapers, the legislatures and the congresses, the ballot boxes and the hearts and souls of the people. They formed gigantic combinations to plunder the poor, to make the miserable more miserable, to take from those who had the least and give it to those who had most. They used the machinery of free government to affect oppression. They made liberty a mockery and its traditions a jest. They drove justice from the land and installed cruelty, ignorance, despair and vice in its place. Their hearts were harder than the nether millstone. They degraded humanity and outraged God at the length. Indignation stirred in the vast course of heaven and overburdened human nature rose in universal revolt on earth. But the very instruments which their own wickedness had created, they perished, and here they lie, sefultured in stone and heaped around explosives as destructive as their own lives. We execrate their vices while we weep for their misfortunes. They were the culmination of centuries of misgovernment, and they pay an awful penalty for the sins of short sight and selfish ancestors, as well as for their own cruelty and wickedness. Let this monument, O oh man, stand forever. Should civilization ever revive on earth, let the human race come hither and look upon this towering shaft to learn to restrain selfishness and live righteously. From this ghastly pile let it derive the great lesson that no earthly government can endure, which is not built on mercy, justice, truth and love. The space at my disposal would not suffice to give more than a faint idea of the terrible tale of Caesar's column. The book must be read to appreciate the fateful lesson that it conveys. Everyone who takes an interest in social affairs should possess this wonderful volume, and even the ladies ought not to pass it by, for it contains much to interest them. Capitalists and workmen, landlords and farmers will do well to read it, not only for the romance of the story, but for the tremendous prophetic and awful warning it conveys. Arthur Desmond, January 10th, 1891